But we're right in the middle of Revelation. We're on the last part. We're on number 20. So put on your seatbelts. Here we go, lesson 20. Uh, the book of Revelation is about how it all ends, and God tells us, finally, about heaven. So my question to you is, what will heaven be like? Is it so far off, so distant in your minds that, that it kind of seems like you can't think about it because you don't know what to think? Well, God has given us some clues, and what I'd like to go through those uh, with you right now, it's a room at our Father's house. Uh, if there's anything I loved when I was a student, it was going home for the holidays. I didn't have a car, I was marooned when I was in Bible school, and I would hitch a ride, and I would ride north, and it would be snowing, and it, we didn't get to a home for Thanksgiving. They only let us go home for Christmas, so we'd go home for Christmas, and usually it'd be dark, it was so long, and the lights in my parents' house, my mother would have every light bulb in the house on, and all those little uh, candles they put in the windows, and I'd see the tree, and my mom would have the door open. And she would, she would be watching. I wonder how many times she opened the door and thought it was the car going to drop me off. Did you know that whole, if you have a family you love, if there's anyone you love that you've gone to, that's the first thing that God said heaven is like. Jesus said, I go to repair a place for you. And that place is in my Father's house. It's your family. And that's where you're headed. So number one, it's a place a room in our Father's house. Secondly, Jesus put it this way, it's our seat at God's banquet. Uh, in the ancient world, most people, other than the rich, had to work every day to get enough food for the next meal. So it was a constant battle. You'd sit down to the meal, then the kids would be happy, but the parents would say, where's the next meal coming from? And they'd have to go out and work, and they'd have to till, and they'd have to harvest, and they'd have to gather. It was day to day. So when Jesus said in Matthew 8, 11, that heaven is like a banquet, in a banquet you don't have to, it's someone else provides it. And Jesus said heaven is going to be like an endless, delightful banquet, and you have a reserved seat. And, and to think about that in that culture for the people was amazing. It's a long for paradise. Uh, Paul put it this way. He says, I... I long to be in heaven, but it's needful for me to stay with you after he went to see heaven in, in 2 Corinthians. It's an inexpressibly wonderful paradise to long for. When Paul saw it, he said there were things beyond description that made him long for heaven. Number four, it's our reserved place. Peter put it this way. He says, you have, in 1 Peter 1, uh, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Christ, to an inheritance, this is Peter's description of heaven, incorruptible, undefiled, that does not fade away, reserved in heaven. Bonnie and I travel immensely teaching uh, next generation students like you and on the field missionaries. We fly 10,000 miles a month. And you know what, for us, when we have the reservations, we know the flight is made, we know the connections, we've made the details, we just go, ah, reservations are made. Of course, you have to trust the Lord that they all fly and, you know, make it. But we go, ah, we have our reservation. When we go to some of these cities that are sold out, you know, hotels, once you get your reservation, you can go, ah. You know what Peter said? Ah, I have a reserved place and the Lord is keeping it for me. That's heaven. It's also, remember what Abraham said? It said he looked, in Hebrews 11, he looked for a city that had foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Who said that? A man living in a tent. Do you know how dangerous it is to live in a tent? I mean, your tent can be, you know, snakes can come in and scorpions can come in, or a herd of camels, you know, all in a stampede can collapse your tent and collapse you inside of it. Do you understand? It was very fragile living in a tent. And he said, I'm looking for a place that has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. It's a secure location. But then, in Revelation 21, and that's where we're going to begin right now, look what John saw, and I call it our home forever. And I saw a new heaven, Revelation 21:1, a new earth. The first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no more sea. Now, for a lot of, you know, Floridians, you love the coast and the ocean. Everybody comes here. It's not talking about there's not going to be any aquatic. To the ancients, the seas were fearful. 
the, the pagans felt that the monsters and demons lived deep down there. And so anytime they were sailing, they were expecting one of those to come up and get them. So they, they thought that, that not only were sea monsters, but they thought the occult creatures were down there too, like Revelation talks about those cosmic monsters. So they didn't like to sail. Most ancient boats followed the coast. If you look at the Mediterranean, when National Geographic does all these you know, wrecks they find, they find them near the coast because all those boats hug the coast because they didn't want to go straight across. And only the big grain boats would do that and, and large sailing ships. But there's no sea, no separation, no darkness and depths that are scary. And I, John, verse 2, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Speaking of the ultimate possible beauty is what God has in that place for us. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle, the dwelling place of God is with men. And he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God will be with them and be their God. And then you know all this. He'll wipe away all the tears from their eyes and all that. Heaven, God Almighty says, is our room that we can't wait to get to, kind of like going home for the holidays. It's our seat at a banquet that, that will last forever. It's our long-for paradise that, that Paul said, Paul got one glimpse of it, and he said, I can't wait to get back there, but I'm going to stay here as long as I need full, but I'm ready to go. It's our reserve place. It's not going away. It's secure. It's not like a tent, and it's our home forever. Well, how do we get there? The book of Revelation tells us that there are seven clear, specific steps from today until heaven, and that's what we've studied all week long. And by the way, that's what will be on your Tuesday exam. Uh, or whatever day it is. The next event for us, the church on earth, which is described in Revelation 1 to 3, is the rapture. Described in John 14, Luke 24, Acts 1. By the way, where does it say rapture in any of those verses? It doesn't. The word rapture is not in the Bible. The word rapture, rapturus, is a Latin word. It's from the Vulgate. It's from the translation of the Greek text into Latin by Jerome. That's where the term rapture comes from. But the principle is all the way through all of the prophetic New Testament writings. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Thessalonians 4, Revelation 3. So the church on earth is raptured for a purpose, to stand in front of Christ and to answer for what we did with our one and only precious life. The most precious commodity we have is our time. And that's why one of the greatest ways to show the Lord that you love him is that you make time for him to speak through his word to you. And to me, it's, it's part of what he's going to measure in heaven, how much of our, our attention we gave him. But when we get to heaven, what immediately follows, we see, we're up there in Revelation 4 and 5 around the throne, and the, the picture in heaven is like we're on this crystal sea, and John gets to come to the edge and look over, and he looks over, and he sees what's going on on earth. Now, I'm not going to repeat all this, but John isn't seeing what's going to happen in the future. He stands there and sees it happening. You go, so it's already happened? Now, wait a minute. We're trapped in the dimension of time. God, heaven, is up above. It's in a higher dimension. And so God looks down, remember what the book of Isaiah says? And he says that he can see at one time the end from the beginning of time. So time is linear, it has a beginning, it has an ending. It's very interesting. And God can see all of it at once. So briefly, John sees what God sees. He saw it all happening. Has it happened yet? From our perspective, no. From God's perspective, he sees the end from the beginning. So that's the tribulation. That's chapter 6 to 18. It's culminated by the second coming of Christ in chapter 19. Uh, you see over there in the blue the church in heaven or the purple or whatever color that is. The church in heaven also is shown in chapter 19. And we covered that yesterday with wearing the righteous acts of the saints. But Christ's second coming uh, inaugurates the great transformation of the earth into the millennial uh, lessening of the curse. Jesus rules physically, in person, 
on earth, and there's that millennial temple we saw last hour, but the sad thing is that a perfect environment, a perfect society doesn't produce perfect people. And so what happens? There's the rebellion. As soon as Satan is allowed out of the pit, uh, he deceives the whole world. And we already covered that last hour. And so now we're covering the final point, Revelation 21 and 22, which is dwelling in the house of the Lord. So there they are, Christ's church on earth, one through three, Christ's church in heaven, four and five and 19, the first half, the tribulation events, chapter six through 18, Christ's second coming, the second half of chapter 19, Christ's earthly millennial rule mentioned six times in those six verses, and then the final rebellion, but we're at the end. We're in the seventh clear event, which is dwelling in eternity, in heaven, with God. Now, you know, you see the Sunday school pictures, and it's great. But you know what Paul said? He said, I have not seen nor you heard, neither has it entered into the hearts of men the things which God has prepared for those that love him, but the Holy Spirit has revealed them unto us. So everything we're supposed to know about that place, God has told us. So beware of all these people that write all these books and make all these movies about while they're on the operating table, they had an out-of-body experience and they see all these amazing things that they write about and get a paid writer to help them write about. And most of them, after a few years, just like recently happened at the Zondervan Publishers where they had to have a news conference where the man that wrote one of those best-selling multi-million books that churches studied in their churches about what heaven was going to look like, he said, actually, we, you know, kind of made a lot of that up. It was really not good for Christendom. So you know what the lesson is that God tells us? Everything you're supposed to know about heaven, I've written in my book. And anybody that writes a book about things that aren't in this book, you shouldn't read that book because it's not true. See, that's what the scriptures say. And what we're supposed to be, and why you're in a Bible institute like this is, you're supposed to be Acts 17, 11 Christians. What is that? When Paul came on his way from being beaten, you know, in, in Thessalonica, or, you know, all the stuff he had in, in Philippi, then he goes to Thessalonica, then he leaves Thessalonica, he's kind of hounded out of there, and he goes to Berea. When Paul, the apostle, the writer of half the New Testament, taught in Berea, do you know what the Berean Christians did? They went, thanks for teaching, we're going home and checking. Everything you taught us to make sure it squares with the Bible. Paul, Paul, preaching was checked by the Bereans. If they checked Paul, I think a lot of these books that are in our Christian bookstores we need to and well worse than that who goes to a bookstore anymore everything people download on their kindles from amazon we should read with a filter up and say wait a minute if you read something you've never heard before and say i've never never seen that in the bible it probably isn't see that's the danger and and i can't believe how many churches had uh this this recounting of heaven. They had all these neat things, you know, horses, uh, you know, with blue and pink manes and everything, and it was just so exciting. And then they said, sorry. You know, we retract that. Okay, Revelation 21 tells us how to get ready for heaven, what God wants us to know, not what, what people fantasize about. The first thing that happened is the old goes and the new comes. Now remember, what you're looking at is, I've done the same study you're doing. The, the devotional project that's one half of your grade is you doing a devotional study of 10 chapters of Revelation. I did all 22 of them, and when I got to this chapter, the first observation or lesson or principle I found is the old goes and the new comes. Here's what happens between Revelation 20, 15, anyone not found written in the book of life was cast in the lake of fire, and verse 1 of 21, I saw new heavens and a new earth. What's What's, that's a quantum jump, you know? What happened? Well, the old polluted by sin universe dissolves. How do we know that? Peter described it. He actually said it's, it's an uncreation. Remember in creation, uh, what the Apostle Paul says uh, in Colossians 1, 15 and 16 and 17, he says, by him were all things created that are in heaven and on earth. Uh, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. He is before all things. Here it is. And by him all things hold together. The universe 
is held together by Jesus Christ, the creator, God the Son. And Peter tells us that Jesus lets go, and it dissolves. He uncreates the whole universe. Remember we saw last hour the whole universe in Romans chapter 8 is groaning, waiting for that. Well, all lost sinners have faced their lives recorded by God. That's last hour. They've stood without excuse, Romans says. They were sentenced to eternal death. That's verse 15. Because their sinful words, thoughts, and deeds condemn them forever. By the way, no one goes to hell because they didn't hear about Jesus. Everyone goes to hell because they're sinners. You know, there's those people who say, oh, 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 those people in the Old Testament, did they ever hear the name of Jesus? And people have to think up all these ways they could have possibly heard that name that was first given. You know, remember, Joseph, you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. So how do you get saved in the Old Testament? You've never heard of Jesus. And there are all these. No one goes to hell for not hearing about Jesus. They go to hell because they're sinners. So everyone is already headed there. Remember, we've talked about that. They're floating down the wide way uh, to destruction. How do they get to heaven? By being concerned about their sins. And when you're concerned about your sins, God has allowed everyone into this universe. I mean, everyone on earth that's ever been born are born with two candles in their hands. You say, really? Where does it say that? Romans 1. They have the candle of creation. And God says that if you'll look, that you will see him, that he's revealed. That's called general revelation. That, that there's a creator out there. I mean, that guy at MIT just wrote his end of life kind of like summary of everything. He said, when I see the complexity of the universe, this is an MIT scholar. When I see the complexity at every level from the microscopic to the macroscopic, it speaks of design. But I know there's no designer. I mean, go, go read his essay. He acknowledges, one of the most brilliant men in America, that his candle he was born with, he sees there's a creator. But he chose to do this. Blow that candle out. There's not, he said, there's not one. Did you know we have a second candle in our hand? It's called our conscience. Conscience is God's ally he puts within us. Now, you read a systematic theology, there's a lot of big verbiage. But basically, it's God's ally inside of every human, every one, from every culture, no matter where in all of human history, everyone's been born with both those candles. And the conscience is, every time we do something that the image of God in which we were created uh, it's a disparity between the image of God that we were created in and what we just did. Our conscience goes, jars us and goes, you shouldn't have said that. You shouldn't have done that. You shouldn't want that. That's bad. And you know what people do? They do what I saw. When I was a student your age, I went to visit a friend of mine that I talked about, the one that took me to the aquarium and fed me. I finally went to his home to see his oil wells and his cows. His mother, this amazing Texan woman, was wearing this giant Texas hat that she wore with ribbons on it and everything. And she said, do you want to see our cows? I said, I want to see your cows. Went out on a Jeep out into their 10,000 acre ranch. And there was a 12, 1400 pound jet black Barzona living steak. You know, that's what I thought of. And it was out there chewing its cud. And it had on its side one of those big triple bar whatever brands. You know how they brand their cows. And his mother jumped out of the uh, Jeep, pulled a hat pin, it was about that long, out of her hat. I always wondered, do they post the, push those into their heads? What is it going into? Because I don't have hair. But you know what I mean. So she pulled out the hat pin and said, watch this. She said, you're in the ministry, right? You'll never forget this. It's a great illustration. She took her hat pin, went up to the 1,400-pound living stake, I mean, with those big horns, and she went, mm. poked it right in the brand. Never moved. She said, see, see, it's desensitized. I mean, I'll never forget her saying it. It's desensitized, she said. When we branded it, she said, it killed the nerves. It just desensitized it. She said, and that's what sin does. See? 
That was a long time ago. I can still see her face. I can see her hat pin. Blow out the creator, say, like the MIT scientist, you know? It, it screams of design, but we know there's no designer. Pfft. You know what we do with the other candle? If you're not careful, you keep sinning, you keep sinning, you keep sinning. And God says there's a point where we've hardened our hearts, where we become like Barzonas, chewing our cud and not feeling any conviction. The conscience is seared like the brand. Those, through their sinful words, thoughts, and deeds, they're condemned forever. Not because they didn't hear about Jesus, because they were sinners. But they're still sinners because they did not follow general revelation to specific revelation to hearing the word which saves them. Okay, we come to the fire that melts the whole universe. How do we get the new heavens and new earth? Well, I've already read this, but I'll read it once more to you. Look at 2 Peter chapter 3. Verse 10, the day of the Lord comes like a thief in the night. The heavens pass away with a great noise. The elements melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works in it will be burned. And since all these things will be dissolved, there it is, the uncreation, the fire, the dissolving, what manner of people should we be? The world will someday pass away. Only Peter explains how it happens. Uh, the fire of God consumes it. And know what Peter says, what I just read to you. But look at the word. What, what does Peter mean the elements melt? Well, God's spirit through Peter chose the Greek word stoichia. It describes the building blocks of matter. God cleanses the universe with his fire from the subatomic level up. How does he do it? He lets it fall apart. But what do we see? Here's my next observation I wrote. Everything unconnected to God burns. See, I saw a new heaven and a new earth and the first heaven, the first earth passed away. Everything, every house, every car that we spent our lifetime polishing, every treasure that we guarded and, you know what I mean, spent so much energy guarding, everything passes away. John says in 1 John 2, the world passes away. The universe, the earth, the world systems are all consumed. But then Peter asks the most important words, if you believe God and know Jesus, and want to please him with your life in verse 11. Since all these things are going to be dissolved, the whole purpose of Revelation, how to live for God in an ever-darkening world. What manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? So the question is, are you excited about the new heaven and the new earth? Heaven with Jesus sounds wonderful, but let's hold it off for a little while. I would say that's a normal thing in polling. It's how we become. If we're honest, most of us would say we're hoping for heaven, but just not quite yet. But why is that? Well, I'll read to you. Dave Hunt, the uh, late great commentator in God's scripture, said, For most Christians, heaven is a place they desire to reach eventually. But not until they've lived out their full days on earth. They have all their hopes and ambitions and interests, and contrary to what Jesus taught and the early church lived, they're really bound up to life that they aspire to live on earth. It isn't that they want to serve the Lord their whole life. They just want to live all these, they have their bucket lists and their dream houses and their boards of all their stuff that they want to buy and afford and, and accomplish. And to be suddenly raptured to heaven, for most Christians, is an unwelcome interruption to all their earthly plans and ambitions. It's interesting. And that's because most of us have forgotten to embrace where we're headed. That's why I think, you know, people say, I just met at a Bible study, I told you about it. Um, it's, someone, it's a group that were watching our videos on YouTube and tracked me by what I say where we're speaking and they contacted me and said, you're actually driving by our Bible study, could you come on Friday night and see us? We're watching and discussing and having Bible study. I thought it was fascinating, I got there. Every one of them were executive vice presidents. Every one of them were part of a $36 billion corporation. Every one of them, uh, they said that the average person working at their corporation, the truck drivers in the corporation, retire with over a million dollars in their, in their retirement account. Every single regular employee. I mean, it's a very successful business. So can you imagine what the executive VPs and presidents get? And they said to me, 
We're studying Revelation with you, and we have one question. How soon is this going to happen, and what's going to happen to America? And I said, it could happen at any minute, and things don't look good for America. Because God has blessed America because we were the greatest exporter of the gospel. Through all the great missionary movements, nobody pumped out more missionaries to the ends of the earth than America. There were more Bible schools. There are more American Bible translation versions than anything else. I mean, in the history of Christendom, we've surpassed it all. But no more. No more. We've cooled. Uh, we desire to be rich and increase in goods and have need of nothing. We don't want to be controversial, and we don't want to suffer very much, and we certainly aren't into, you know, getting persecuted, and so we've toned down. Wow. Did you know the only purpose, I think, that America was put in this place was so much, and, and, and what does it say? God shed his grace on thee, you know, and crowned thy good with brotherhood, all those great old hymns. I think that uh, the best thing for our country is to have a lot of trouble with the electrical grid and to have all the electronics stop working and to default on our $40 trillion in debt and have everybody go back to nothing. That's when Christianity flourishes. It really gets sick when people are rich because they're increased in goods. That's revelation, have need of nothing. But I'm not teaching on that. I'm teaching on revelation. So, but that's what I told them, and I'll tell you what, it was a very sober group that night. Uh, but let's think for a minute of your last moment on earth, okay? Psalm 23, 4 says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil. Why? Because you're with me. You've all heard that. Most people have memorized that. I mean, you all know the 23rd Psalm, some form of it. The Lord is my shepherd. What does that mean? Well, I thought I'd read to you a, a little snatch from a funeral. Uh, one of the things, I mean, I was a pastor for, for uh, 38 years with Bonnie, serving all over, uh, but I've done hundreds of funerals. And so people invite us back and we'll fly in and, and do a funeral for one of the dear saints we serve. I'll read you a funeral. Jesus visited, and it was the city where I was, on Sunday, and I gave the date, to meet another of his precious children. Just as a dark and cold river of death began to flow, and the valley of death's shadow began to creak open, the only one who ever defeated death and destroyed him that had the power of death, that is the devil, extended his arms toward David. That's whose funeral it was. It was 5.45 a.m., and all of a sudden, David... Laying in his hospital bed was acutely aware of hearing a voice. As he listened, he realized it was a voice he knew so well. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice, and they follow me. So to that voice of his good shepherd, David looked up on that Sunday morning, which was going to be the greatest day of his life. David heard the voice of Jesus coming to take him to heaven. David saw Jesus standing there, the one who had been crushed for his iniquities. He looked at Jesus' face, the one that was bruised for his transgressions. And then David saw those hands extended to him, still had the marks that he was pierced for David's sins on the cross. Those nail-scarred hands reached out for his hands, and David reached up. Now, his family didn't uh, know all this was happening. All they were doing is, like mostly, they were all glued to that monitor, and all the things were going down, and the heart rate was going down, and, and, and he was having trouble breathing and everything. His family only saw that his tired and worn-out body had fallen silent. But David had already firmly grasped those hands of Jesus, slipped quietly out of bed, and headed with Jesus to the place prepared for him in God the Father's home above. Did you know that's the purpose of a funeral? To declare the truth of what all of us believe, what happened. His tent, his body, the clay pot of this dear friend of mine uh, who taught my children in Sunday school, who traveled the world with me on missionary trips, that clay pot was there to be put back into the ground from which it came, but he was not there. Uh, he had moved on. Have you ever thought about your first moment in heaven? Well, all of you students have read about it. It's in Revelation 3, 5. And this is what it says in Revelation 3, 5. 
He who overcomes will be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I, here's the first, what's going to happen to us, I, Jesus said, will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. Wow. As we learn in Revelation, we come led by the nail-scarred hand of Jesus to meet our Heavenly Father. At last, finally, we get to meet him because Jesus paid it all, and it's our highest delight. We gather before God, a miracle of grace. Well, back to the funeral. This is what I told the family. Listen for a moment what happened using Revelation 3.5 to David at the hospital. On that moment, just before 6 a.m., David was taken by the hand, and the Lord Jesus himself led him past the marshaled ranks of angels before my father and before his angels. The Lord led him along what we see in heaven, up past the cherubim, up past the seraphim, up to the throne of God himself. And then David, for the first time, heard the Lord Jesus call him by the name that we already saw in Revelation. Nobody else knows. We have a unique pin. You know how your ATM card has a pin? We have a unique name nobody else has, nobody else knows. Jesus knows it, and we find it when he takes us up to his Father and declare his name before my Father and before his angels. Wow. So David heard the Lord calling by name, presented in person to God as his beloved child, and then he heard God the Father say, Bring the best robe and put it on him. Think of it, a robe that's white and bright as pure as light. When the Lord Jesus was transfigured, something happened not only to his face, but his clothes. His raiment became white as light. What a reward for all of us that are completely forgiven. Well, let's, let's go to verse 2, or we'll never get through Revelation, okay? We're going kind of slow. We're doing that for the, new, the visiting students to know it's easy here. So you should come. We're only in verse 2. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven as a bride adorned by her husband. Wow. Dr. Harry Rimmer, he was a great, oh, if you guys have time to read and like to read Golden Oldies, all the books Harry Rimmer wrote are the best. He was a, a scientist par excellence who got saved. And he started talking about what that MIT guy wouldn't say, that this scientist saw at every level, whether it's the crystalline structure of minerals or whether it's the, the physiological characteristics of the oozel bird, a bird that floats like, like air or smoke on top of the water in the mountain streams of Colorado, but it can suck all the air out of its body. Does, I wonder how that evolved. And it can plummet to the bottom of a fast-moving Colorado stream, and it can walk through the moving water a bird can walk and find its food, and then it comes up to the surface and <laughs> puts air all the way back. It, it's like a vacuum-sealed little device. It's amazing. And he wrote book after book showing the creator. Well, this is how he wrote his own funeral. I mean, I would think Harry Rimmer would do that. He says, I can't reach my home in the city of gold without passing through the dark valley of shadows. I'm not afraid because the best friend I ever had went through the same valley long ago. He drove away its gloom. I hold his promise in a printed form that he will never leave me or forsake me. He will be with me as I walk through the valley. I'll never lose my way as long as I'm with him. Well, what's heaven like? I'll just summarize this. Uh, we have 15 minutes left, and I have 14 slides. You know what that means. Heaven is, number one, our creator. Isaiah 46 says he's the only one that's carried us from birth. Read Isaiah 46 sometime. I, even I have carried you from birth, I have walked you through life, and I will carry you through to the end. Our creator. I mean, you had an obstetrician or a midwife or somebody that was at your birth, and your parents, of course, and, you know, loved ones were excited and met the new baby that was born and wrapped up. But as you go through life, they fall away, they die, you know, they're gone, you can't find them. But one person, our creator has carried us from birth. By the way, he's our guardian. He never sleeps. He says that in the Psalms. I, I watch over you. I never slumber or sleep. Romans 8, 28 tells us what he's doing. He is personally working everything in our life together for good. We covered that the first week, his attributes, 
his omniscience, knowing what's coming, his omnipotence, stopping anything he wants to, his omnipresence, he's with us, his love. He's our designer. Psalm 139 says he actually invented the double-coiled helix of our DNA, which last month a Nobel Prize winner found out even has a self-repair mechanism. He's going to get a Nobel because he found out that DNA has inside of it a self-repair mechanism. They cannot explain how something that evolved knew how to fix problems, but it's very interesting. It's because God invented it. He's our friend. I mean, I already covered Psalm 1611 with you when I talked about God wants to show us the path of life. As long as we stay near him, I use the microphone as a cell phone tower, near him we have fullness of joy. He, he radiates that joy, and all he wants us is to choose to stay near him, and with him are endless pleasures. But let me illustrate it this way. Anywhere on earth, water is the supreme repository of life, okay? Uh, if you take one drop of water out of any one of these palm, ponds that are all around, I mean, I drive by that one there, always think an alligator is going to come up and get me from it. God has demonstrated an unbelievable ability to cause life on this fallen, dying planet to multiply and flourish beyond our comprehension. So let me give you one example. Uh, the pictures are some of the little creatures that live out in that pond, but I'll read to you about them. The explosive power of life God has built into this world is seen in any standing water or pond. Water is preeminently the seat of life. There is not a bay, a creek, a shelf, a sound, or that pond that doesn't teem with life. One drop of water from our pond on the road out there will hold 500 million microscopic creatures that are so small that a teaspoon of water from that pond would be equivalent to the Atlantic Ocean to them. So, you know, look at the map and think of you and just think if you're out in the ocean how little you'd be in comparison to that. That's how little they are in one teaspoon. Every drop of ditch water has 500 million microscopic creatures so small that they live comfortably in that drop. What are they? They're a thousand different species in every drop. Some are herbivores, some are carnivores, some have shells, some have no shells. They possess mouths, they have teeth, they have muscles, they have nerves, they have glands. Some of them have one to two hundred sacs or stomachs connected by an intestinal canal. I mean, there's 500 million of them. And they found that one of them has these these sacs or stomachs, the distance between the sacs are one fifty millionth of an inch. Only a God who is infinite could have worked such majestic scale that the same complexity you see in the galaxies and the stars and everything out there is on the, mic the macroscopic, it's on the microscopic level too. Now let me ask you this. If God can make a thousand species in one drop of water, with such complexity. And none of that is made in his image. He just made it to point to him. Can you imagine what he's built in heaven? See, heaven is wonderful. He's our completer. Look at Jeremiah 15, 16. God says, if you will take this book, thy words were found and I did eat them. Our only job is to eat them. Thy word was for me the joy and rejoicing in my heart. There's only one thing that can make you, no matter whether you're one of these bubbly types or one of the lower key, minor key people, you know, that are kind of melancholic, no matter who, there's only one thing God promised to make joy. You know what joy is? It's being detached from our circumstances. Most people are very barometric. I mean, if things are going great, oh, if things are going bad, oh. And God says, I can detach you from that. I give you joy. Joy is not giddiness. Joy is a settled confidence that I know my completer. He's the one that completes me. None of these passing, you know, things I want so bad are going to complete me. He gives me satisfaction, joy, delights, and thrills. Jeremiah 15, 16. By the way, he doesn't change. Everything else on earth changes. He says, I'm changeless. I made the laws of nature. I keep my word. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he said he's almighty. And he demonstrates it by the endless vastness that we're looking at. 
So what he tells us is heaven is a place. Like I quoted, Abraham was looking for a city that had foundations. When you look at the images in Revelation, the flashing fire, the lightning, the burnished bronze, all that stuff, it all speaks of splendor and permanence. By the way, what is colors of heaven? This is the high priest's breastplate that's in the, the Temple Institute Museum where they're trying to replicate everything from the Old Testament in Jerusalem. It exactly matches the colors that we read about here in Revelation 21, 19. I think that's why, and I've told you this for two weeks, the early believers thought much about heaven. Modern believers, maybe not. But they thought much. In fact, Graham Scroggie said, the whole of Revelation is reproducible from the Christian writers of the first three centuries. They preached about it that much. Now, look at one detail. Look at verse 16. And the city is laid out, this is 2116, in a square. Its length is as great as its breadth, so it's a perfect cube, okay? Why is that important? Why are, have you ever thought that every detail in the Bible, God put the details in the Bible, and there's a purpose for it being in the Bible, and that's what our life of, of devotionally studying the Bible gives us the treasures of finding? Why is it a cube? Its length is as great as its breadth, and he measured the city with a reed. It was 12,000 furlongs. Its length, its breadth, and its height, they're all equal. So that's like 1,500 mile cube. Now what in the Bible is an exact cube? And we have every measurement to exactly know it's a cube. The holy of holies. See, what God is saying is, Heaven is a 1,400 or 1,500, depending on how you measure the furlong, cube shaped like the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle. Every gate is probably this pearl that, that goes up above the walls of the city. Wait a minute. Why, why does it say that the gates are pearls? Wow. Well, think about a pearl. A pearl is formed through the injury of the oyster. And we're reminded forever as we walk in and out of the gates of heaven that he was wounded and crushed and bruised for us. And we're going to be there drinking the water of life. And, and remember what Moses, when Moses was on the mountain with God, he absorbed some of that amazing radiance of God's presence and he glowed. Did you know that what sustains us in heaven is we're by the source of life? Okay, Chapter 22, or we'll never get done. Quickly, chapter 22, uh, the first 11 verses, the final book centers on the ninth verse. Let me show you verse 9. Because after John saw all this stuff in verse 8, when I heard it and saw it, heaven, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel. That's how awesome heaven is. When John got done with his tour, he just collapsed, and he just was adoringly looking or holding on or whatever he was doing to this angel, his feet. Look at verse 9. He said to me, see that you do not do that. <laughs> I am your fellow servant. That's what an angel thinks of who they are. They're fellow servants with us. And of your brethren, the prophets, and of those who keep the words of this book. Here's the bottom line. This is a conclusion of all this looking at heaven. What's this supposed to do to us? Worship God. Worship is honor and adoration directed to God. Worship God. Worship is the mark of true believers. Remember what Jesus said? We are, we are those who worship God in spirit and in truth. What keeps us from worshiping God? Well, chapter 22, verse 12. I'm coming quickly. How does Jesus apply going to heaven? I'm coming quickly, verse 12. My reward is with me. I'm going to give every one of you according to your work. Whoa. Jesus is saying it matters what you do with your one and only precious life. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are those who do his commandments. Do you know what ruins our rewards in heaven? On that final trip through the valley of shadow of death, we don't take any baggage with us. We can only send our money ahead and we can take people with us. How do we know we can take them with us? 1 Thessalonians 2, 19 and 20. Paul said to the Thessalonians, you are my hope and joy and crown of rejoicing at the coming of Christ. He said, you're going to be associated with me when I see Christ. We, the people we impact for eternity, we take with us. 
But only what we send ahead will make it to heaven. And here are sins that rob us of Christ's full reward. If I would say the modern sins of America, it's a lust for comfort and convenience. As a pastor, if it rained or snowed, attendance was down 40%. Why, were people's lives imperiled? No, they don't like to get out in the rain and the snow. I mean, it's amazing. We have a lust for comfort and convenience. If the temperature's not right, if the air conditioning's not right, if the sound system is not perfect, we don't like it. There's a greed for recognition. People move around to where someone will recognize them for what they're doing. And you know what God says? Great, but you just got your reward. It doesn't count later because you wanted the applause now. And finally, and this is what hinders missions, a covetousness for security. Did you know serving God is very insecure? Most of the people in the Bible did not have a happy ending as far as the world is concerned. They, were, they wandered around in sheepskins and goatskins, and they were, you know, all the things it says in, in Hebrews, they were, they were persecuted. It's not secure. It's not convenient. It's not comfortable. But what we're supposed to do is the Bible opens in the Garden of Eden, a paradise. It closes with the same paradise. And when you think about Eden, it was, it was perfection. But what we need to remember is we're going to stand before Jesus. That's how he ends this. I'm coming quickly, verse 12. My reward is with me. I'm going to give each one of you according to your work. And what he's going to ask is, would your life live for God? Or did you just waste your time on everything else? The Lord is not going to examine your playlist. The Lord is not going to examine your gaming status score wherever you got to. He's not going to examine how bulked up you got or how beautiful you got. He's going to examine whether your life was lived for his glory or wasted on everything else. So how do we get to that point? Well, I gave Bonnie the keys, but usually at this point I take out my keys. And as we travel around, we driven around in 35 countries teaching in places like this, and I'll be driving along, and Bonnie say, you know what, I'd like to drive. And I go, okay. And if, if, if Bonnie's going to drive, I pull over onto the shoulder, you know, well off, and I, I put the car in park, and I turn the key off, I pull the key off, I open my door, I run around to her side, I open her door, and I hand her the key. And she has the keys and sits in the driver's seat, and she drives the car. My question is, who's the driver of your life? When we surrender, we pull over our life every day. Did you start this morning with that? We hand the keys to Christ. We get in the passenger seat. We do what Galatians 2.20 says and say, I want to live my life crucified with Christ today so it's no longer me but Christ living in me. Well, thank you for listening. Pray for us. As, uh, as you already have prayed, we're going on and we're just going to keep doing this. This is what we do, teaching people like you. If you're old enough to be on Facebook, Young people are not on it anymore, I've heard. Uh, you can friend us, and I have so many word of offers that I watch where they're going, uh, where the Lord takes them. You can subscribe to us on YouTube. I post a devotional every day. And I want you to think for the rest of your life what heaven will be like. God bless you.